Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Head. Taisha Tyler. The Tribe Called Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz. Seth Meyers. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim, and you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Ow! Hello, and welcome to the Talk House Podcast. I'm Josh Modell. If you'll indulge me, today's conversation is kind of tailor-made for me, though I hope it is for you as well. We've got two songwriters that I've admired for ages and ages and who admire each other greatly as well, Death Cab for Cutie's Ben Gibbard and Teenage Fan Club's Norman Blake. Now, it's no secret that Gibbard deeply admires Blake's band. In fact, he called 1991's masterpiece Bandwagon-esque his favorite album of all time. He loves it so much that just a few years ago, he recorded and released a cover of the entire thing, and it's awesome. With that album turning 30 this year and with a fantastic new Teenage Fan Club album set for release, it seemed like the perfect time to get the two together. Now that new Teenage Fan Club album, their 11th, is called Endless Arcade, and it's really, really good. If you've fallen off the band's train over the last few years, it's a great place to pick up the thread because it sounds absolutely fresh. Partial credit for that freshness may be due to a big change. Founding member and frequent songwriter Jerry Love left the band a couple of years back, leaving the songwriting to Blake and Raymond McGinley, which changed the balance a bit. They've also added Euros Child from the band Gorky's Zygotic Monkey into a more permanent part of the mix on keyboards. Let's hear a little bit of the album's opening track, written by Blake, called Home. Every it means to be and all this time I've been holding on to a memory I sometimes wonder if I'll ever be home again Ben Gibbard had a rough start to the pandemic he had to cut the last Death Cab for Cutie show before lockdown short because he was too sick to continue probably COVID He's kept plenty busy during this weird time, though, playing dozens of online shows for charity, writing new Death Cab material, you'll hear about that in this chat, and even releasing a covers EP called Georgia that benefited the progressive candidates in that state. For this conversation, the two old friends dive into what their pandemic lives have been like, which includes lots of songwriting and record collecting. They also talk about the joy that comes from being a lifer in the rock and roll business, and how streaming has affected all of the above. Enjoy. So are you in your studio? It's looking like you're in a studio. Are you home? This is my little home studio. You can see there's uh, some instruments back there. It looks like you are at home. Is this where you live? I'm actually at my parents' place. This is my parents' home. I'm just outside Glasgow. Okay. I've been staying with them during lockdown. So I've just been here for a few months uh, while we're getting ready to put this album out. So I've been here. So I'm back in the teenage bedroom experiencing that again, which is it's fine. It's good. The folks are um, in their 80s. They're great, you know, they've, they've been vaccinated and they're, they're easy going. So, yeah, it's good being here. My parents are in their early 70s and they were just able to get their shots about a month ago. So anyway, all good. And uh, but, but, um, unfortunately, we're supposed to be on tour at the moment. I think we're on our second postponement. But it looks like the shows that we have for later in the year are going to happen. We have some shows that were rescheduled, some outdoor shows that were supposed to be last September. Yeah, that. We are now trying to schedule for this coming September. They might have to be at reduced capacity. Yeah. But unlike you, my bandmates are spread across four cities. And we have not actually played music together in over a year. Same for us. We did shoot a a socially distanced uh, video in Edinburgh. But that was playing the same song um, about 300 times. But other than that, you know, we haven't played together for over a year. So it's kind of weird because you're kind of used to doing that. That's kind of your life, right? You're out doing shows or rehearsing. I do enjoy playing guitar and whatever, but the most pleasure is when I'm on stage with other musicians and there's a group of you making music, you know? And so, yeah, it's really strange to not be doing that. The last show we played was on March 1st of last year. And I had gotten very sick leading into that show. I'm still unsure if if, whether or not I actually had coronavirus. It also could have been a especially brutal flu, but we played, I think, five songs and I, I lost my voice and couldn't sing. Yeah. And we canceled this, you know, headlining festival slot. And that was the last memory I have of being on stage is storming off stage, frustrated. Oh, that's horrendous. I had a similar ex- experience about um, 
well, a couple of years ago now, we flew via Bali from Japan to Australia. And on the way down there, I started to not feel too great. I was in bed for the first couple of days there. We did a show and that was sort of okay. But the next day I woke up and I, I could speak okay. But as soon as I tried to sing, I couldn't sing at all. I mean, nothing. So um, we had to do like three shows in Australia. And Eros, obviously on keyboards, Eros kind of filled in all the bits for me. And I was just kind of squawking away at the front. And so I know that feeling. It's horrible, isn't it? Because you kind of feel like you can go for the notes and then you try and it's, uh, it was horrendous. So, but yeah, have, if that was your last show, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I played a number of uh, shows over the computer in the last year, but it's, I think as singers, we, I didn't realize how often I just break into song just to kind of amuse myself when I'm by myself. I'll just end up singing some melody, not like a crazy person, like not walking down the street. I think as singers, we just, I took for granted how often I use my voice for my own entertainment, not only to, to write or to perform. Yeah. Well, what have you, what have you been doing in this period of lockdown? And have, have you been writing a bunch? So the album that we've got coming out in just a few weeks now, we were lucky and that we'd done all of, the, all of the recording. So for the first part of this, we were mixing uh, and again, sort of socially distanced mixing. So we spent a couple of months doing that, tweaking the mixes, got all that together. And then just, you know, just prepping everything, getting the artwork together. And then you start to impress. And then actually, other than that, I've been doing lots of walking, just trying to get in shape. I'm not quite up to your standard of uh, running. Are you still been uh, mountain running? Are you still doing that? Yeah, I still am. Last year, I was signed up for this 100 mile race. I kind of try to do one of those a year. It's like my yeah. like spiritual quest, I guess. And everything was canceled, of course. And then I found myself with this injury that took me out of running for about two months in the fall, which was just this kind of like, oh, of course, I can't, I can't play shows. I can't travel. And now I can't run. <laughs> it's a mentally somewhat of a challenging time, but you move on. We've been kicking this can down the road of when we can start making this record. And we, we have plans to be in the UK making an album. Okay. Uh, it's looking like it might be the kind of situation where because of scheduling and everything else, not to mention the fact that none of us are willing to leave the country to or to are fully vaccinated. Yeah, sure. Makes sense. Looks like it's going to be probably early next year. I guess my question would be, since you finished the record over a year ago, what has it been like sitting with a record in the can for that long because I go through this period between finishing a record and that record coming out that I feel somewhat creatively stifled. It's hard for me to work on new material till that. You sort of can't move on until that's gone. Oh, I know that feeling exactly. It's unusually for us. We're normally working right up to the deadline, you know, so that we need the album, you know, last week and, you know, whatever. So it's been kind of strange for us to have something finished and done. And, you know, it did allow us to go back and sort of tweak a few of the mixes, which you normally don't get to do. You know, you have to do the mix and then you send it off and that's it. Bye bye. So the great thing was that we got to have an album that we were very happy with sonically. That was great. But yeah, sitting on the, the songs and having it all done for a year is frustrating. And yeah, inevit inevitably you've got other ideas. I've, I've done a bit of writing. I think Raymond has too. And I think we're keen to do some recording soon because it's been such a long time since we've been in the studio, so we will probably do that, you know. I've been experimenting with working uh, on uh, different ways of demoing, not even sonically or with different instruments, but I started demoing, demoing on an iPad on GarageBand, or GarageBand as we call it over here. Um, but I guess it should officially be called GarageBand because it is a, an American product. I've been messing around with that and trying to keep myself interested looking behind you, you have guitars and amps. When people say to me, what are your hobbies outside of the band? I say, well, I like guitars, you know, and I like buying records and I like music. I, I, those are the things I like to do. So I've kind of tried, be, been busy. Yeah, a bit of writing, messing around with, you know, iPads and little synth apps and stuff like that, you know, so. Uh, and I, I, what have you been doing? Have you been doing similar, I take it, writing, more writing, or have you got an album finished? The band started working in this kind of, way we, we had never really worked before. Normally I would just write songs and then put them in a Dropbox and the guys would go through and say, yeah, I like that. I like that. And I have some ideas for that. And then we'd go into the studio and just work off of the demos that I had made. Yeah. Uh, at some point last year, I kind of created this format. We would write a song every week where mm. on Monday, let's say Zach, our keyboard player would make a piece of music and then send it to Nick, our bass player. Yeah. And then play on it. And on Wednesday, he would send it to me. I'd send it to Dave. And along the week, everybody in the band had complete editorial and creative control over that piece of music when they had it. So yeah. if you heard something you didn't like, boom, it's gone. Or oh, I want this song as halftime, I want it to be a double time. You could do whatever you want. So 
ended up writing some pretty interesting stuff that way. So, you know, I've been writing songs of my own. The band's been working in this fashion. Hmm. We've been kind of punching up some demos. I wrote a theater project with my friend Daniel Handler and uh, this guy Torquil Campbell from the band Stars. Oh, I know Tork, yeah. Yeah, I know Tork, yeah. We've been friends for a long time and we were like, do you want to, and even before the lockdown started, Torque and Daniel and I were like, let's work on something. This was like the perfect opportunity to finally delve into that project. Um, then buying a lot of records, I finally, only about a month ago, actually put my entire collection into Discogs. And now I'm moving to the 45s. And that is, oh, sure. you know, some, some people bought Microsoft stock in the early 90s, and that's how they made their fortune. And I think my fortune has basically been made and guided by voices, 45s. I think about records that I bought 35 years ago, and I, th- I often find myself thinking, I wonder what, how much that is. And then you sort of look, and there's the median price. And, you know, what I like about that is it gives you actually real prices, what people have actually paid for these things, you know. I look back on it now and think that was a great investment, that record collection, because there are some things that go for crazy money um, nowadays. There is one record that I've got, that I, I, and this is a good one because it, it's nowhere to be found on Discogs. No one has sold, bought or sold it for years. I picked it up on eBay about 15 years ago, and it's a song. It's on the first um, Nuggets box set by a band called The Rumor. The Rumors are U-M-O-R-S, and the song's called Hold Me Now. And they picked this, you know, seven inch up, uh, like $20, something like that. I think it's worth an arm and a leg. I've never seen it anywhere. I'm, hopeful, I'm hoping to see it appear. I'm hoping it's like with Frank Wilson, Do I Love You. The Motown one that's worth about £500,000 or whatever. It's amazing that you can, you know, put your collection in there and see how much everything's worth. More than anything, it makes me realise just how much time has passed since I bought some of these albums. These that you bought in the 90s for six or seven bucks and due to this relative scarcity and time elapsing they've become worth and also to I, I, anybody who's listening i totally recommend doing this putting all your records into discogs because it then it gives you an opportunity to re-interface with your records i don't have you know a insane collection but i'll find things that i kind of forgot about we forgot that i had this this record that was kind of in between two other albums and the sl- i just couldn't see the spine and then i put it on like oh, i love this record well, you really get into the weeds when you get into, okay, which pressing of this Rolling Stones record is this? Because yeah, you look at the matrix numbers and all that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. You're like looking at the run out groove and kind of like read the etching and yeah, yeah. This one pressing is worth fifty bucks and this other pressing is worth ten. Yeah, the sort of tiny incremental change in the catalog number makes it worth. Or the, yeah, yeah, totally. Well, do you know what? Actually, after we speak, I'm going to download that app because I don't have the Discogs app. That's something to do. Thank you. You've given, given me a, you go. good, a good, that's just a good thing to do during lockdown. So. Are your albums in Toronto? Most of them, but of course, I've got some things that I've got here. In fact, just a few weeks ago, I was up in the attic space, my folks' place, and I found a big box of cassettes. I found like lots of old fan club things, you know, like from the Manor Studios when we were making Bandwagon-esque. But I found like Daniel Johnson cassettes that I picked up from Waterloo Records in Austin. First time we were there for, I think they were like, Three ninety nine, mm-hmm. amazing. You know, you think um, it was nice because I, I, when I found them, the sort of glue has all gone kind of brown. You know, they kind of look, and I thought, oh, they've been damaged by sit, sitting in the attic space. But no, actually, that's what happened over over the thirty years since those have been, you know, recorded and made by Jeff Tartikoff. All the all of them look like that. If you find you, you know, it's difficult to find old ones that aren't tarnished in that way. So it's a, a genuine patina. I think you would call that. Wow. Well, you know, if you need somewhere to send those old teenage fan club uh, mm-hmm. tapes and outtakes, you know, you know my address. So, oh, she will. I think I probably do have some doublers up there, but um, but it's it's amazing. So just your boxes of cassettes and you know, compilation cassettes, hundreds of them actually. And so, I mean, most of them are still up there. I have to, you know, pretty dusty up there. But um, yeah, it's amazing. So that's been a bit of a journey. Well, let's let's pivot and talk about the new record, which I'm really enjoying. It's the first record you guys have made without Jerry. Yeah. And what I found really interesting about the album is just by the sheer mathematics, mm. having three songwriters down to two, now both you and Raymond are more featured on the album. You're, it's kind of split exactly down the middle, and it's really wonderful to hear a couple more Raymond songs, a couple more of your songs. It's always going to be different when you have a founding member leave. Obviously, in my band, we've experienced this. When Chris left our band in 2014. And you lose something, but you also gain something 
I'm curious in this transition in your band, what what do you feel you you guys gained? Well, it's funny because you know Dave is now on bass, and Dave's been with us for about 15 years more, I think possibly. Dave played keyboards and guitar for all that time, but Dave is uh, primarily a bass player. He's a great bass player, and and he's got a different style than Jerry, so that's different. There's a different element there. Also, Eros Childs is now playing with us. He's still doing his own solo thing and all that, but you know he's kind of like a member of the band now. And that's been great too, because he's coming up with really interesting keyboard lines, things that we probably, you know, because as I said, Dave, Dave has played keyboards with us, but I think Dave would, uh, as, as always, I don't, doesn't think it like a keyboard player, if that makes any sense. But Eros, is, he's always played keyboard and piano, so he's coming from there. And he's brought some really great stuff too. But it's interesting you're talking about the way that you'd worked and the way that you were sending things around to each other. Because I think on this record, what we did, we, we did, the, went completely the, the opposite way. And myself or Raymond would come in and just play the song. Here's the song. That's all the information that we're going to start from or we're going to use. And let's, let's just start playing. And so everyone was coming up with their own parts and we came up with the arrangements together in the room. And that's maybe something that we haven't done so much in the past. Whoever had written the song would probably direct things a bit more than that, you know, um, which is normally what happens, right? You know, if somebody comes in with a song, they'll have an idea of what the drums should be and maybe the bass could kind of do this, and the, you know. But this time we didn't do that at all. I think we thought because it was a new uh, setup that it would be better to just let everyone find their own space in the song. And I think it really worked. It made it quite fresh sounding. It made it probably a little different than what it sounded before. Although still, you know, maintaining the thing that's Teenage Fan Club, which is verses, choruses and solos, you know, maybe a key change. But as much as we miss Jerry being around, it's, it's been good. We've really enjoyed playing. And I can certainly hear that in the record. The way everybody's playing together, it feels very organic and it feels very much a Teenage Fan Club record. It doesn't feel like if I were to put this album on, not knowing that a member had left and, and new members had joined, there's nothing that jumps out to me. Sure. Well, that's good to know. It still feels very much like a Teenage Fan Club record. And I think also with Eros, I'd been playing with Eros, making records with Eros, and he, Eros had actually sung and played in one of our previous albums. We've known him for, you know, 25 years. So it wasn't as though there was anyone coming in who was an unknown quantity. When Chris left our band, of course, it was a bittersweet. Sometimes these things are a long time coming, but when they do happen, you are left in a situation of like, how are we going to move forward? And yeah. We felt confident that we would be able to do so. Yeah. I feel that lingering thought of like, oh, I wonder, wonder if this is going to be good difference and be bad different. We kind of moved into this new iteration of the band, which now is, you know, seven years deep with Dave and Zach. Yeah. It was a really revigorating transition. It, in some ways, it felt like a new band. Yeah, yeah. We have two new people who we had known in some capacity for years before, mm. but now we're able to go out into the world and experience the audiences together and experience traveling and exploring new, you know, new places or places that we'd been before mm. together. It was such an invigorating kind of uh, shot of adrenaline into the band after so many years. Yeah, that's great. And as much as it was sad to see Jerry go, it has, it's been good. We've had a good time together. You know, it's like we... You know, we're, we're, we're all excited about making music, you know, um, and the touring's been a lot of fun. And again, we're all keen to get into the studio again. And uh, yeah, yeah we've got long may it continue. We'll keep, we're going to keep playing. I think, you, I'm sure you're the same. You just want to keep making music, right? It's what you do. I mean, what am I going to do if I'm not doing this? Yeah. And we're lucky. Both of us are lucky to be able to tour and make records. Absolutely. There, not a day goes by that I don't feel so incredibly lucky that at 44, this is still a thing that I do and that I actually do it professionally. I think yeah, yeah. when I was younger and the band was kind of on its ascent, I was of an age where if I needed to or wanted to, I could have easily pivoted to some other profession, gotten my master's or whatever. And that was the plan early on. I think it was like, well, we'll do this indie rock band and maybe we'll make enough money when we tour that we don't have to worry about jobs for a bit, but eventually life is going to catch up. But then at a certain point, you realize you're a lifer. I remember being in some European airport waiting for a flight and David Johansson from the New York Dolls walked by with a couple of people. And at this point, the dude is in his 70s probably. Yeah. Yep. And uh, you know, he's still just rocked out to the nines. He's a lifer. But I saw this guy, I was like, lifer. I think that maybe in a way we got into this line of work where we we had this passion for music because we didn't necessarily want to be a part of uh, the real world. 
Yeah, it's amazing if we can make a record. And then you get to make that record and then you know, get to go out and tour and you're all in the back of a van. We did literally from this house, actually, we would take the mattress from the bed there and chuck it in the back of a transit van that didn't have any windows. You know, <laughs> so the unlucky two or three people would get chucked in the back and locked in there. Oh, you know, with a big bag of beers or something like that, you know, whatever. Fine. And then the, the lucky people would get to sit in the front. And we toured, the first touring that we did was that way. Um, you know, and then you're thinking, oh, well, this is all a bit of fun because you're 21, 22. Um, and then, you know, things just develop and it just kind of happens, doesn't it? There's no plan. There certainly wasn't a plan for us. We've never thought beyond maybe getting to make another record. And we're still, it's, we're still excited to make them. So, you know, hopefully we've never become too jaded. I don't think we are jaded, you know, still. You are one of the least jaded people I've ever met. Thanks. <laughs> and, and, and one thing I've always appreciated you, because we've known each other since, what, 2004, 2005, I think, probably. Out of out of all the people that I've kind of met in my musical travels, I've always appreciated just how, how present you were and how much you seem to really respect your audiences. You've always come across someone who's just genuinely thankful and grateful that the people are, are there to see you play. Yeah. And I just wonder, was there ever a moment in the band where you guys were in the middle of whether it was like a long tour cycle or you know, just maybe the band's not getting along where you felt differently or have you always felt that way? I think it's, we've been lucky in that it's all been pretty good. We've had periods in the, you know, the history of the band where we'd, you know, we'd, we'd play shows and there wouldn't be that many people there, but we've always been relatively... Um, lucky in the sense that we've had good, decent audiences. But yeah, it's peaks and troughs, isn't it? You know, some albums do well, others don't do so well, and there's, you can't really put your finger on why that is. But in terms of the audience, we're always very conscious of the fact that they've paid money for that ticket. I always go back to myself as a kid, and I went to see The Clash three times in Glasgow, uh, give them enough rope to Sunday in East, the London Calling. I saw those, those tours, uh, which were pretty amazing, but I'm aware of the fact that, you know, as a kid, I was young, but I paid money for those tickets. and. And they put on a brilliant show, you know, and you can imagine how disappointing it would have been if you'd gone there and they weren't interested, you know. So I've, I've always been conscious of that, that people are paying money and they're having to make the journey to get there. The least you can do is put on a show for them or try your best to put on a show for them. A friend of mine, uh, Travis Morrison from the Dismemberment Plan, we were on tour together in 2002. And it was one of those stretches of tour where you're driving eight, nine hours a day. And in America, there's this stretch where you, when you're going west along I-80 or something and you're playing yeah. Salt Lake and then Denver and, and Lawrence, it's just, there's not a drive that's less than seven hours. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I was probably in some mood or just tired or whatever and talking about how like, oh God, I wish we didn't have to play a show tonight. And Travis kind of stopped me and was like, look, every night of the week is somebody's Friday night. Yeah. Some matter if it's Tuesday, somebody bought these tickets and they tacked them to their, you know, their like cork board or whatever. Yep. And they've been waiting for the show and it, it's their Friday night and you, you got to bring it. And I've always tried to kind of reference that moment and that mentality. I have always haven't been successful at it. Sure. I, th I always think that too. It's someone's fr it's Friday night. It's the show night, you know, for you, it could be show number eight in a run of 25 or whatever, you know. But it's someone, someone's paid. That's the night you're going to see, and you and they paid the money for those tickets. And uh, yeah. yeah, I went to see you guys in San Francisco when Michael Lerner was playing guitar with you guys. Yeah, I was kind of standing on you know side stage, watching you guys, and it was really interesting to look at the audience and see people my age and older, but also kids there that were in their early twenties, if they were a day, or maybe even teenagers. Yeah, yeah. You know, they knew the they knew the lyrics. They were singing along. It was clear that they were fans of the band. Mm. I found that really heartening for a number of reasons. Not only one because I've you know been a fan of your band since I was fourteen, mm. but also it seemed like it was this uh, reminder that of the emotional power of your guys' music that you had to be there to experience it. If you weren't a fan of this band in the moment they were making these early records then you wouldn't quote unquote get it you know no sure it, it, well it's yeah yeah it's great to see younger people at shows but what's an, I, I think part of that is probably the thing that they have that we don't have uh we didn't have back then streaming platforms you know spotify that that kind of thing now, as much as we kept, we're not happy that they they don't pay us musicians properly right. 
Um, as a, a, a medium and as a way to hear music, it's incredible. Well, if you think back, when I was a kid and you know, I'd hear people talking about bands, oh, you should listen to the seeds. Like, oh, okay, right, yeah, how am I going to hear the seeds, right? So, I, but now someone can mention a band and you, or you can go online and listen to that music instantly. I mean, I've been listening to, uh, I bought the, the Harry Sword has uh, brought out a, a book, is it called Monolithic Undertow? It's about the history of drone music and, and there's a, a playlist to go with that. There's things like Tony Conrad and all sorts of obscure stuff that you would just never be able to find in the past. It's all there. So you can read the book and reference this music in real time. Kids can do that now. So you, you, you wonder, what, well, I know that some kids hear a band through their parents. Uh, I've heard people say, oh, yeah, well, you know, when I was a kid, my folks played bandwagon-esque and I really liked it. And it's, there's some kind of nostalgic attachment for them. And sometimes if you're lucky, they'll say, and I like the new stuff too. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> but um, so some, kid, some people find it that way. It's great that people have access to that now because, like I say, in the past, well, you could go to a record store and buy something, but you could buy one thing a week, right? Because you know, didn't have the money. My wife and I went to a cabin this weekend with some friends. And on the way back, I had put on a, like a pavement, like essentials playlist or whatever. And eventually Summer Babe comes on. And I turned to Rachel, my wife, and I'm like, this is some real old man shit here. But the way I ended up buying Slanted and Enchanted was that I read about it in a magazine. Yeah. I couldn't listen to it. I just... Sounded like something I might like. Yeah. I go to Seattle, which I, I had to ride a, a ferry boat an hour to Seattle, go to a record <laughs> store, buy the yeah. tape. <laughs> and then, and, you know, initially when I listened to that record, I didn't quote unquote get it. I didn't, I was like, yeah. oh, this, is, this is so weird to me. And you know, I listened to it over and over and over again. And eventually it just became one of my favorite records. Yeah. And I think that when we talk about our era versus the era that kids live in today, I think I would probably would have given anything at that period to have access to every yeah. piece of music ever. You just formed a different relationship with music. I wouldn't even say a better relationship or a more pure relationship, yeah. just a very different one. I was in the car with my wife and my sister-in-law and I asked them like, when was the last time you bought a record without hearing a note of it? And, and they both were like, I don't remember ever doing that. It is. It's amazing, that, isn't it? Because, yeah, you just, you would take a punt on something. You would say, okay, well, you would read the review. That's why, that's kind of where the, the art of music journalism lies, in a way someone can, you know, describe music uh, in a way that, you, you know, you, you think, well, that's going to work for me. A good music journalist will be able to do that well. But the thing that, that streaming can't do, and the one thing that I miss, and the thing that they haven't recreated properly, is the artwork the way that you would play a record in the past, but you'd get it home and you would open it up and you would have the inner sleeve out and it would all the recording information, the lyrics recorded in whatever studio, all that detail, all of that stuff, you, you kind of, you don't have. Plus, oh, I've always thought of, uh, of uh, album covers as being kind of a good way to have some nice art in your home, your apartment or whatever. You can, you know, you, you would always lie your favourite record at the front of the pile or the one you thought looked cool and whatever. You know, so there is that thing that you don't get from streaming platforms. The convenience is incredible, though. Yeah, and this is a slightly name-dropping story, but it's important because I want to give him credit for this. My manager also manages Bob Mould, and, and we have become close over the years. And we were at our manager's house. We were at, listening to records and talking about music. And I was making a point similar to yours. We like to think, as people of a, an older generation, that because we had to walk up uphill both ways through the snow to get a punk rock record, that somehow our relationship to that music is more pure or better than a kid who opens up Spotify or whatever. And I was taking the argument, which I still take, which is that, look, it doesn't matter how music comes into your life. If you form a relationship with it, yeah, uh, that's all that really matters. It doesn't matter if you heard it on a streaming service or in a TV commercial, or if you had to go to the one record store to find the record. If, if you love it, you love it. That's all that matters. And Bob's yeah. Something which really stuck with me, which is, well, it's not how music comes into your life. It's how it leaves. If you're listening to a, an LP that you just bought and you're not enjoying it the way, as much as you thought you would, you have to physically go over and either take it off the turntable or skip the next track or flip the record, listen to the other side, or, you know, put it away, file it away, you know, put it in a cell back pile, whatever it might may be. You have to actually interact with a physical medium. Yeah. When you're listening to exclusively to streaming, that music 
disappears as quickly as your finger can swipe the screen. Yeah. And it seems to me, and I've had this experience listening to music via streaming services that even I, as a, as a, what I would consider like a serious music fan still find myself, I'm not going to listen all the way through the record if I'm, if I'm not immediately feeling it, but if I would have either purchased that record or had a physical copy of it where as lazy as I sound, but invest in it. I got to just, you know, put out, figure out something else to put on of these other physical mediums that I have in front of me. Like it, it really is true that when you wipe something away with a, with a whisk of your finger, it does create a, a different relationship to to it. Things have really changed and in terms of music being a commodity. I think it's re really difficult for bands now to get established. And I think an interesting thing is that, you know, major labels, that kind of, the, part of the reason that that is over is that they, they, they're not prepared to invest in artists. I always think of David Bowie as a good example of that. He didn't have any success until his third album. But you would think if he was a contemporary artist now, after album number one, it would have been, see you, David, <laughs> thanks. But no thanks, you're probably, very possibly, you know, we may never have heard those great David Bowie albums if, uh, if the, the model that we use now had been used back then. Those records completely flopped as well, but they st he still got to make them. You know, we still, we have them now, you know, it's, it's things have changed quite dramatically. A friend of ours, we were meeting at this cabin out in the islands, brought a bunch of records and bought, brought like a Hall & Oates record from the 70s. And we were commenting about how, I think this was their eighth record before they had like a hit or something, like a, a proper, yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> they had made so many albums before they had a quintessential, like unabashed hit. Yeah, and yeah, sure. They're laughing about like, wow, there is just no fucking way that would happen. Oh, no chance. No, no way at all. Yeah, you just, it would be, they would be long gone. It would be long gone. Do you think, can you imagine the money they spent in each of those albums? You and I are both of a generation that experienced the tail end of sales as an income stream. And now touring is ostensibly the main source of income for our entire band. And it's been, it's unfortunate, but it's a, very much a reality that our industry will assuredly be the last one to really come back yeah well, it's almost like we've gone back to how musicians worked 100 and uh, something years ago they made money from playing you know the record industry started in whatever the 30s and then and it's kind of come full circle albums you don't really sell albums you don't get paid for streaming so you have to go out and play live so i think you know yourself and my band we've been okay and that we can do decent shows and we can make decent money which means that we can make a living from this we can pay the mortgage yeah and i want to make it very clear that I'm, I'm definitely not crying with two loaves of bread under my arm yeah no sure yeah yeah your band and my band have been maybe not the best word but kind of grandfathered in if we decide to spend an extra year without a record it's not going to it's likely going to like kill our careers you know no sure but i on this period the, the musicians that i've felt the most sympathy for were the acts that maybe they put out their first record in 2018 or 19. Yeah. They're about to put out their second record. And uh, that momentum is just absolutely destroyed. Yeah. I really hope for, for their sake that when we're able to go out safely again and, and go to shows that people will pick up where they left off and their fandom and their attendance at shows and, and whatnot. I think there's going to be a period of where we're going to be fighting against consumer confidence where people are not going to be quite sure that they want to go out and be inside or the psychological toll of this past year of not being able to be in a grocery store with more than 15 people without feeling endangered is going to have more of a long-term uh I, I think you're right I, be, I, I do hope though once they get beyond that are going to get really invest in going to shows again because when people regain confidence the restaurants and bars and music venues are going to be rammed full of people but that's still some way off i think there's going to be a gradual thing but I am confident that by the end of the summer, things are going to pick up. We are being offered festivals again, and the promoters aren't going to organise those festivals if they don't think they're going to happen. Sure. So I'm confident we're going to get out of this, and it'll be great. And hopefully we can be doing some shows together somewhere. Yeah, I was listening to an interview with Daniel Lenoir last week, and he mentioned that he, the interviewer, a friend of mine named Joe Plummer, has a podcast. He talked to musicians, and he was talking to Lenoir and asked him, what is it going to be like when we're through this thing? Mm -hmm. And Daniel Lenoir had said, well, I think it's going to be like the, literally the Roaring Twenties. You know, people yeah. spent a year plus inside and uh, there's going to be a readjustment period. But once they're through that period, he, his hope was, and I'd like to agree with him, yeah. it's going to go nuts. It's, you know, people are going to be <laughs> just partying their asses off. Well, do you know, I think he's got a point because I think, you know, the, the Roaring Twenties happened after the Spanish flu, what, at the tail end of the First World War. 
I think that's probably what's going to happen. There's because I think people will be really be looking to celebrate being alive again because there have been some pretty dark moments in this in the past couple of years. And I think now that we're coming out of winter, I mean, you're really noticing it here. That's one thing. Uh, uh, and I think actually in, in Seattle, you have light quite late in the day, don't you? Because you're, you know, you're fairly high north in the US anyway. But here, summer, I mean, right now, this is, we tend to get summer a little bit early here. It tends to go away quite early as well. But right now, it's really sunny here and it's getting dark a little bit later. Right now, it's getting dark about quarter to seven in the evening. Getting that extra light at the end of the day is brilliant. And I think just in terms of getting everyone's spirits up again, that's going to be a, a, be really important, you know. Yeah, this this past January into February was really difficult for me personally. And for a lot of people that I talk to, I'm sure it's the same for you because we're at a similar latitude. The days are so short in the winter. Yeah. And that's difficult on a non-pandemic year. It's, it's difficult. Yeah. You know, you're able to go out, you see people, you go to shows, you go to bars, you, do, you know, you, you make the best of it. And having... All of that social interaction removed equation. Mm -hmm. You're just left with the sun comes up at eight and goes down at four, and it's raining, and and you're despondent because of you know. Oh, let's say in our case, armed insurrection is trying to take over the government. Stuff like that, you know. Oh yeah, it's been a pretty chaotic, pretty chaotic few months over there, hasn't it? Yeah. Outside of five hundred fifty thousand people who have who have died, and let's not certainly not make light of that. It took a real emotional toll on me and a lot of people that speaking to you about it but you know the the silver lining so to speak is that yeah the days are getting longer the sun went down at seven ish yesterday yeah and you know i'm as i i've been in glasgow in the summer it's amazing the days are super long yeah yeah really great in a way it's worth all the darkness in the winter to get those long it kind of balances up doesn't it the last few days have really felt it changing There's lots of birds around and you know it's, so it's really we're on the, the way out when i'm at my folks here in the summer We'll have dinner and then I'll just go for a big long walk, you know, and I, I really enjoy that. It just it's a nice, you know, just like being in that space, that headspace or whatever, just maybe listen to music, maybe not, maybe just listening to the sounds of uh, nature. Oh, it's been fantastic. And as we're looking towards the summer, I'm really hoping that everybody that I'm friends with, that I socialize with should be hopefully getting vaccinations in the next month to two months. And we yeah. start to have a, like a kind of proper, proper summer again. As I said, we're starting to, Look at maybe doing some shows in the fall, and yeah, and you know, and looking forward to those shows. I have this feeling that it's going to be very difficult to, I, I you know, apologizing to anybody who might be at the first show that we play once we're through this thing because I, it's going to be an incredibly emotional experience without just bawling my eyes out because I, the power of being with the guys and and having an audience in front of yeah. Well, I think even before that, being with the guys when you get to the re rehearse, going to be something else, isn't it? I don't know if your band keeps a text thread, but we have a band text thread and we you know, send links and goof off on stuff and whatever else. But mm -hmm. every once in a while, somebody says something rather poignant. And I think it was Nick who chimed in maybe in November or whatever. And he's like, I'm never going to complain about being in some random ass town in the middle of the week when it's rainy and the crowd doesn't seem to be into it. I'm never going to complain about that again. This last year has been a real eye opener and how yeah. truly how fortunate we all are that we get to do this for a living and that after all these years people still want to see us play and i'm hoping that we can carry that sentiment deep into the future like i'm never going to complain about a sunday in the blank you know some town that i don't want to be in <laughs> so it's kind of easy to take things for granted isn't it you just think it's always there i mean who saw this coming now we were going to be here with uh, you know not having played for the longest time it's it's, it's going to be amazing i said for me the thing i think i'm looking forward to most is the volume of the band striking up that's going to be something else you know just hitting that that first chord boom going to be i'm really looking forward to that you know yeah well i hope that we get to uh see each other in person soon well that would be great be great to see you hopefully see you soon what are you, what, what are you doing with your day because i mean i guess it's still fairly early there for you you ben what, what's your plan yeah so i guess my day is going to be i'm going to go i'm going to do a, a workout on my bike i have a like a road bike but i got an account with this this thing called zwift you ride with people from all over the world it's kind of amazing mm. uh and they made you know they have all these different worlds in zwift yeah and uh Speaking of kind of getting emotional about dumb shit, you can ride in London or New York in Central Park, oh. Paris. Or yeah. And, you know, they've they've constructed these worlds that are fairly accurate. And I remember I was riding in Hyde Park, around Hyde Park in this wow. Zwift. 
I've run this perimeter of Hyde Park more times than I can count. And so I know it like the back of my hand. And it was just so eerie to be like in this virtual world riding in London mm -hmm. and getting kind of emotional about it because I knew every turn. Yeah. And I was like, as close as I'm gonna get to London anytime. So I'm gonna go exercise and then I'm we're kind of the band is taking a little bit of a break from writing for a while to kind of let the ideas that we've been developing kind of sit. Yeah. So I think I'm gonna spend a good part of my day here in my studio with with a bunch of seven inches here and start putting these things away, I kind of start filing them all in, seeing if I have any other gems. Yeah. I'm gonna get really hairy when I get into the 45s that are just freestanding 45. Like what what pressing of this weird Trogs single is this? Okay, sure, yeah. Well, that sounds like a fun way to spend the day. Thanks for listening into the Talk House podcast and thanks to Norman Blake and Ben Gibbard for spending some time with us. Check out Endless Arcade out on Merge Records and find all of Ben's activity on Death Cab for Cuties YouTube channel. This episode was produced by Melissa Kaplan and the Talkhouse theme was composed and performed by The Range. Thanks for listening. See you next week.